Hello, Bell Isle Church family. Uh, God bless you and happy Sunday to you. As you can tell, uh, I'm not with you here today uh, in person, but I am with you in spirit. I'm in Las Tunas, uh, Cuba, and I brought a small team down and we are ministering to our sister church in Las Tunas, an incredible relationship that we have had over the past 14 years. And it is a joy for us to come down to their church and minister to them and pray for their leaders and encourage them. Uh, it's gonna be a wonderful time. I'm gonna send some videos uh, to you so you can see that. But uh, as you can tell, I'm not there, but uh, I bring in the very best when I'm not there. I, I really am very confident in not only our pastors when they minister, but also a few of gifted friends and uh, leaders in our community and beyond to come and minister the Word of God to you today. And today is no exception. Kevin Craig is going to be ministering and speaking today. Uh, he's been well received over the years and he does a phenomenal job. He's a gifted communicator and a godly man of God. He's not only my friend, he's my golf buddy, and he's a wonderful pastor in Apopka Thrive Church. And he's doing an amazing job in our community and we're delighted to have him today. So uh, as I'm not there, I want you to treat him as you always do with your know, generosity and hospitality and welcoming. So let's give Kevin Craig a big Bell Isle Family Church welcome. God bless you, Kevin, as you minister today. Well, good morning. Um, as Scott said, um, my wife Kelly and I pastor Thrive Church out in Apopka, Florida. Uh, have been there 28 years this month, so they haven't been able to run us off. We just keep sticking around like a bad penny. It's great. Um, our church is interesting um, because the driveway to the church is actually a county road. And so I, I never knew. It actually, I was there a decade before I figured that out. I thought, man, we got this really cool. We got a driveway with a name on it. And then I realized it's not our driveway. It's a county road. And I didn't figure that out until... Uh, the bank, this bank bought some of the property next to the road and, and had their, I thought, well, that's really rude that this bank's using our driveway to our church. So I went over there trying to get some money from them and figured out I don't own that road, which made sense on a couple other things finally. I, I'm not the sharpest knife in the cupboard, uh, so it, it took me a little while to sort that out. Um, what was interesting, though, was after about 18 years, down the, dry, the road that was the county road and it got to our property and the paved part stopped and theoretically the road continued through our property, but there was no road. And so that's why I'm, I guess I thought it was our driveway. Um, but about 18 years into us being there, um, the manhole and the line that drained the water down the side of the road began to collapse. And so I thought, well, since the city has made such a big deal about it being their road, I'll, I'll just call them and tell them, since it's your road, come fix your road. Here's what I figured out. When there's a problem, it's my road. <laughs> and when I want to build something, it's their road. And so I, I would go down to the, to the city hall and I would regularly have a discussion. I'm like, so you can't come fix it. No, sir, we can't come fix it you've improved the road. I'm like, but you won't let me build anything on the part that's in my property because you're saying it's your road. Right. I said, please help me make sense of this because that doesn't make any sense. It's either your road or my road. It can't be your road when it's convenient and my road when it's inconvenient. They're like, well, that, sorry, we just can't do anything. And the, the collapse part got worse and worse and worse and worse to where finally you could just see a hole there my dad uh, saw me frustrated one day, and he, he, said, um, he said, why are you so frustrated over this? I'm like, well, I explained the situation to him. He said, um, he said well, I'll, I'll go down there and fix it. Now, now my dad, uh, he, he's, he's an interesting guy. Uh, he, he, um, he, he gets up at 5 o'clock every morning, and he's 80 years old, and he still gets up every morning and wants to text everybody and plan everybody's day at 5 o'clock. And I keep saying to him, you're retired, you've got to stop this, but he, he's insistent. Uh, just the other day, I had to tell him, um, you know, you're not 30 anymore. He went outside, and he rolled his trash can to the road at 530, and there was a bear out there, and he decided to yell at the bear. I'm like, what are you doing? Uh, number one, I said, if that bear gets mad, you can't outrun him anymore. Uh, so, so he's an interesting guy, but he actually used to work in a, uh, an area of, of business that 
helped uh, his company that he was the president over help build pipes that went in drainage under roads. He said, well, let me go take care of this for you. I'm like, okay. So every week we'd have a little updated meeting and I'd say, are you making any progress? He goes, I'm working on it. I said, do I want to know what you're doing? He goes, well, I'm going down there and trying to figure out who the right person is. So I keep taking them donuts. He said, I think I finally found the right person. And so um, a month or so later, we're out there and the line's just totally collapsed now. And, and I said, Dad, we can't go any further. They either got to fix it or we got to fix it. Somebody's going to get hurt. He goes, I got a solution. He goes, do you mind if I take some liberty with this problem? I'm like, just fix it. So he picks up the phone. He calls the city of Apopka to the connection that he's made. He said, hey, he said, I don't mean to alarm you, but, there, but you know, this, you got this collapsed line on this road that you say is ours and we say is yours. We've been arguing over it for 18 years. He goes, I think I saw a school bus full of kids go down through there and the bus disappeared. <laughs> Within 15 minutes, the city was at our property. We had not been able to get them on the property for 18 years, but they were there in 15 minutes. So my dad stood there and said, what do y'all think about that hole down there? That guy said, that's horrible, Ron. I can't believe. So said, why didn't somebody tell us? He goes, well, we've been calling you for 18 years trying to get you down here to fix it. The guy said, well, it is our road, so we'll fix it. My dad takes out his phone. He said, could you say that one more time? So after 20 years of battling with the city, they ended up fixing the road at their cost with a better product than we would have spent ourselves. And then my dad went back to them and said, now that you've fixed the road, can we get you to abandon it to us? They said, Ron, you're pushing it. He goes, well, he said, I've been, I've been pestering you for, for five years over this. He said, I'm gonna keep coming. They said, dear God, we'll just give you the road. Could you please just leave us alone? You see, having the right person fight for you that is mighty in the battle makes all the difference in the world. If you got the wrong person with no might, nothing ever gets done. If you'd stand with me and take your Bibles just for a moment, I want to just read our verse today as we open up. Because I believe I've got a word for you. And I believe I have an assignment from the Lord of something prophetic I'm supposed to release to you today as well. But if you've got your Bibles, you could go to Psalm 24. And while you're standing and turning to Psalm 24, you know, it's always, always a delight to be here and to preach in a place that Scott George calls uh, his place of ministry. Uh, Scott and Tammy are two of our very, very oldest and dearest friends. Um, I have such tremendous respect for Scott's walk with God, for his communication skills and ability. You know, he, he's just a, I, I don't know if this is, is fashionable to say anymore, but Scott's just a good man. And, um, you know, the great thing is you'll continue to come, in, come, come into church here and know this, he will continue just to be a solid, good man. And um, if you entrust your life to follow him as he follows Christ, that's a good deal. Amen? Psalm 24, verse 8, David writes this, and I love these words. If you don't mind me reading from the New King James, it's my favorite Bible that I'll take notes in. Verse 7 says, Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, that the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty and mighty in battle. So we continue uh, Scott's series for the year, and obviously today our message is the Lord mighty in battle. Would you just place your hands on your hearts? Let me just pray for us today. I just believe I got a mandate to release and that you'll receive it today and that the Holy Spirit would lead us and Jesus would get the honor. Lord, today I just want to be under your leadership and care for, Lord, anything I've got to say to these people is irrelevant, but what you have to say is life-changing. So I just step out of the way and yield to you and ask you to give us liberty and direction as we move forward today in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. You can be seated. Uh, you got a set of notes when you came in uh, this morning, and there's some fill-in-the-blanks. I may, or, I may or may not remember to tell you what to write there. 
So if I get to go in and don't, and don't tell you, just say, hey, preacher, number one, so I'll know where we are. You'll notice that there's a weird letter with a strange group of uh, words next to it. Do you see that on your notes? It's spelled R-E-S-H. You see that? Am I, am I in the right church preaching the right message here today? I just want to make sure. Oh, there it is. They put it up. So the way that you pronounce this in Hebrew is uh, mighty in battle is Yahweh Gabor Milkama. That's the, that's the actual Hebrew pronunciation of this word. Now, here's what's fascinating that I've come to understand about um, reading the scriptures. When it was interpreted into English for you, originally from Hebrew, and then obviously the Greeks in the New Testament took the Hebrew and put it in Greek. But the original language of all of your scriptures has a Hebraic base to it. When they interpreted it from that language into English, the English interpreter had a, an incredible time of trying to give you the best English word to describe what those that recorded the scriptures in, he, in Hebrew in ancient Hebrew, we're trying to communicate. And understand this, when the Hebrew writer under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit wrote these things down, the Hebrew language was actually in pictures and the numbers were pictures. So we have sounds and an alphabet and numbers, but all of the Hebrew is, is pictures. So the word mighty in is the actual word, then battle is a separate word, but mighty in battle, that mighty word is actually four Hebrew pictures. And this is the first one, the first letter, it's resh. And it looks like a, a kind of a strange seven. So there are four Hebrew letters that describe or, or where they derive the word mighty in. What's interesting is what this letter means. It means someone who has influence on their surroundings that other people will listen to their ideas and are in awe of their personality. A person that has a name that starts with the phrase resh are great communicators and have the ability to open the hearts of others, even when they're closed to their other understandings. So understand when David is trying to tell us that God is mighty in battle, here's what he's saying. Before I introduce anything else about God and how he interacts in battle for you, Know this, that God has such authority and influence around his surround, over the surroundings that you're in, that he has the ability to open hearts when they're closed to their surroundings. The other four letters are fascinating because, and I, I didn't have time to get them on the notes today, but, but it's Resh, and the second one is Yod. It looks like a small I with a, a dot above it. The third letter is, is bet, but it's pronounced like mate, bait. It, it looks like a, um, a, an upside down backwards U with a little dot in it. And then the last one is a, looks like a hangman's noose. So, so here are the four letters that make up mighty or the pictures. It is resh, yod, bait, and the last one is gamel. So let me give you a quick, just so you understand how, how incredible this description of who God is, what it really is. It, 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 the word yod is, it's, it, it's uh, a, a word that means hand or arm. The word bait is a letter that means a house or where you live or a window. And gamel is a camel or provision. So basically, when, when David's writing that God is mighty in your battle, here's what he's saying. God has such influence by his mighty hand that his prosperity will protect your house spiritually, physically, and emotionally. Hang on. Did, did you hear me this morning? Anybody listening? So you understand that, that the English writer couldn't paint all these pictures for you, so he just put mighty there. But this word is so much bigger describing what God is with every battle that you're facing. That he is influential and has authority just with his word to move his hand and to transform everything in your life, your house, to move it into a place of blessing and prosperity so that you don't lack anything. 
Isn't that wonderful? So every battle you face, that's the God that's showing up. It's the God that's moving his hand to influence whatever's coming against your prosperity. And you understand, I'm not talking about prospering just in money. For some of us, wouldn't we love to just get up and have a prosperity of peace? Am I, anybody with me on that this morning? Look, I, got, I still got so much conflict going on around me. My wife says you cause conflict just by showing up, but I don't believe her. Look, sometimes we just, we just have conflict everywhere. I would love just once to get up and not have 200 emails to return. I average about 270 emails a day. I'm trying to figure out who's junk on my email list. I would just love to get up one morning and open my email. There'd be nothing there. I love showing up to church and somebody going, hey, I emailed you today. Did you get that? I'm like, yeah, it's in 275 other emails. I'll get to it one of these days. I told somebody, I said, look, if, if it's an emergency, say it's an emergency. And an emergency is not, I need to return a library book to the church. I would love to have a prosperity of joy or peace. Or, 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 or health in every area of my life. Look, I, I'm post 50. There are things that don't work anymore. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Come on. I, I mean, I, I, every once in a while I get up and I start uh, about my activity and my day and, and I forget that I'm plus 50. I started running with, with two of my girls that were training to run the New York City Marathon in 2024. I thought, that's easy. We got about three miles into a 13-mile run one morning. They turned around and looked, and I was nowhere to be found. They turned around and came back. They said, what's wrong, Dad? I said, I got to that three-mile point. I just figured out I got a perfectly good car. Why do I want to do this anymore? In my mind, that did not sound difficult. But when I got out on the trail, I'm like, who in their right mind would run unless somebody's chasing them? Anybody know what I'm saying this morning? Just... Oh, that was much easier 35 years ago. The Lord is mighty in battle. If you look at your notes this morning, I felt like the Holy Spirit told me to tell you three battles that he's mighty in, that his hand moves in to move you into a place of blessing. Number one, the Lord is mighty in the battle against your enemies. The Lord is mighty in the battle against your enemies. And, and guess how many enemies you have? Look at your notes. This, this, is, this is not a hard question. Look at your notes. How many? How many? You got two. Let me identify both of them. One is the devil himself. But the Lord's going to be mighty in battle against the devil. You know who the other enemy is? You. You know what's amazing? If I ask you which was the most difficult enemy to overcome, you would say the devil. You know what the Lord told me, though? He said, you know, when I delivered the children of Israel, I beat the enemy in one night, but it took them 40 years to get their minds right. You're thinking that your biggest enemy is overcoming the devil. Listen, the devil hates you, that's for sure, but let me remind you why he hates you. He hates you because of how, how beautiful he was, Lucifer, and what he was called to do. Did you know he had every instrument on the inside of his being with the exception of one? Did you know this? He had stringed instruments, drums. He had every instrument except one. And the one he doesn't have is a trumpet or a shofar. Did you know why God has a feast called the Feast of Trumpets? It's because it's the one instrument that the enemy doesn't have. You know why he hates you so much? Because your dirt that God breathed into and your esophagus is created in the perfect shape of a, of a, a shofar. And it's the reason he hates you so much is you've got the one instrument he doesn't have. Did you realize when this team gets up and leads worship, if you'll open your mouth and begin to shout, you are sounding the one instrument the enemy has no access to. Come on, somebody. That was worth praising God for. You see, there's a reason David said lift up a shout. What you don't realize is when you just, just shout to the Lord, it doesn't even have to be anything understandable. When you lift up a shout, you're sounding the one instrument that the enemy hates because he has no access or ability to have it because God created it in you. God's mighty in battle against your enemies. Number two, God's mighty 
in the battle for your miracle. Anybody need a miracle here today? Only me and John. Anybody else here need a miracle? Come on, don't lie. Anybody here need a miracle? Healing, finances, fix your husband. I'm preaching in the right crowd now. This lady in the back started waving at me. She's like, yes. Your wife, your kids, anybody like me, you know, your, your kids, they cost, my, mine are all post-20, and they cost now more to me than they did when they were five. I thought I was going to get them to a certain place when they got a job and that they were, I wouldn't have to worry about it anymore. I got one kid that makes more money than me, and every time they want to come see me, they want me to buy their airline ticket. I'm trying to figure out how that works. <laughs> I couldn't help but think about the recording of the woman with the issue of blood in Luke chapter 8 and in Mark chapter 5. If you don't mind, let me just read a couple of verses out of this story because it's, it's absolutely incredible. I know you know the story. She's had this issue of blood for 12 years. Jesus is coming through town. A man named Jairus that's the ruler of the city, the most important man in the city, he, he cajoles Jesus to come to his house to pray for his daughter, who's also 12 years old, by the way, interestingly. And along the way, this woman with this issue of blood hears about Jesus and Mark, I believe, describes it best. I know I've, I've got, I gave them Luke, but let me, let me just read this if you don't mind. It, it, it says, verse 25 of Mark 5, it says, Jesus went with Jairus, and a great multitude followed and thronged him. And a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years, had suffered many things from physicians, and she'd spent all she had and was no better but worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. And she said, if I only may touch his clothes, I'll be made well. And immediately, her blood was dried up. The fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. Let me pause here for just a second. What's lost in the story at times is the cost of her touching Jesus. For the fact that she was bleeding and in public was grounds for being stoned. And when somebody had an issue of blood and they touched somebody clean, according to Jewish law, the unclean made the clean unclean when it was touched. So we focus so much on the fact that she touches Jesus, but pause with me just for a second. How many people did she have to push out of the way to get to Jesus? How many religious leaders? At least 12 disciples. You realize that with each person that she touched, she made them unclean by the law. And with each count of person that she touched, it was sensible by death. Do you realize that by the time she gets to Jesus, she probably has 40 death sentences against her for who she's touched. And yet clearly she does not believe. And she's so desperate. She does not believe that her infirmity is greater than Jesus' ability not only to heal her, but she's trusting that when he heals her, everybody else is going to be taken care of too. You see, that's not only faith on her part, it's faith on everybody else's part too, right? Now, here's what's amazing. I had never seen this before. And this is what gets me so excited. Jesus knew in himself that power had gone out, and he turned around and said, who touched my clothes? Now, how many have read that verse or heard that preached before? Am I preaching in the right crowd? You know what I just realized? She got healed before Jesus knew she was healed. Did, did you just read that? It says when she touched him, she was instantly made well. And then Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? I felt power go out. In other words, the mighty battle plan of God was that the divinity of God outraced the humanity of God. Is somebody listening to me this morning? You see, we think we've got to beg God to move. 
God has got a battle plan where he moves even outracing his self. Isn't that good? On top of that, oh, I love this. She's the only one at the end in verse 34. It says, he says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, be healed of your affliction. Did you know she's the only person in the Bible that Jesus refers to as daughter? Now, we don't hear about this lady anywhere else in the Bible. But if you've been to the Holy Land and you've walked the Via Della Rosa, you've seen her place. Her name is Veronica. And she was along the Via Della Rosa. Isn't this interesting? That when Jesus is bleeding, she's the one that offers the cloth that wipes the blood from his head. Years earlier, Jesus touched her issue of blood. Later on the walk to the cross, she touches his issue of blood. If you don't think God has a redemptive battle plan for your life, he is mighty in battle. There might be some things that you don't see how they're going to come back around again, but here's the good news with God. He is such a redemptive, renewing, empowering God that regardless of where you are and what's going on in your life, he's got the ability simply to renew it and redeem it on the spot. Isn't that good news today? Touch your neighbor and say you're not a lost cause. Touch somebody on the other side and say, I don't know about you, but that person over there is not a lost cause. (laughs) Isn't that good news today? God is mighty in the battle for our miracle. Finally, last but not least. And you're going to have to pray for me on this one because I'm going to preach an entire book of the Bible in 30 seconds. Number three. And I feel like this is what I came to tell you today, really. He is mighty in the battle over his plans and promises for your life. He is mighty in the battle over his plans and promises for your life. I need you just to look up here for a second. I'm going to cover the entire book of Esther in two minutes or less. And if I get to saying Ruth... I really mean Esther. It's been a long morning. (laughs) You remember that Esther becomes queen through a wild set of circumstances. And ultimately, Mordecai, who helps her land her queenship, saves the king's life, and he's praying at the city gates. A man named Haman is elevated by the king into a place of prominence. And every time he walks through the courtyard, he expects everybody to bow down, acknowledge him, and honor him. Everybody does but Mordecai. Mordecai just says, I worship God. I'm not worshiping you, not honoring you. I, I'm not, I'm not you, you don't mean anything to me. I serve only God. This enrages Haman. Now, in in our church, I only preach this at the time of the Feast of Purim, which is in the spring, and I'm sorry, I'm scared to tell you what they do, but you know, when this story is actually read, and every time Haman's name is mentioned, everybody boos. So you get one time. Ready? Three, two, one. Haman. So can you imagine trying to tell that story, and it's over and over again, but that's, that's what happens every time the story of Ruth is read. So please let me finish. We'll be booing all day. So Haman is so enraged, but he uses his position to go to the king and say, hey, look, there's a group of people that have grown into the millions in your kingdom. And they won't listen, and they won't obey, and they're a threat to you. You should do something about it. And the king takes off his ring It's his authority ring, a signet ring that basically means that anybody that stamps that ring on something, it's an immediate law. And he hands it to Haman and he says, you do whatever you see fit to help my kingdom rid itself of these people. And he's so thrilled. 
Mordecai hears about the plan, and he is just, he tears his clothes, he's crying, he's sobbing. He gets word to Queen Esther and says, hey, look, here's what's going on. You're the king's queen. You can go to him and tell him and get this reversed. She says, I can. If I, if I go unannounced and uninvited, I'll, I'll be killed if I don't get invited into the king's presence. I'll be, I'll be killed. And Mordecai's comment is so interesting. I think it's Mordecai, it's um, Esther 4 or whatever. He says, look, God's going to save us. I love his statement of faith. God, look, God's going to save us. The question really is this. Do you want to be part of the solution or not? God, God will send us, he'll send us a savior. The question is just really, do you want to be a part? She says, well, let me fast for three days and sort this out. So he prays and she fasts. For those of you that have ever heard the story, just let me sum it up quick. Through several banquets that she throws for the king and Haman, thank you, it finally is revealed when the king offers her up to half of his kingdom. It finally comes out in the drinking of wine my mother-in-law says loose lips sink ships, and if you throw some wine in there, the loose lips get going on a lot quicker. <laughs> it's finally revealed that Haman's the one, she speaks up and says, well, I'd love for you to overturn this decree that's going to kill us, all my people. He says, who would do such a thing? She says, Haman, who's standing right there. The king is just, he can't believe this. His trusted authority ally has now done everything he could to kill his queen's family and, and descendants. The king is just, he's just distraught. He goes out in the garden to walk around. Haman thinks, well, I can beg Esther for help. He trips and falls on her, and the king comes back in and sees him on top of his wife. He says, that's it. You're done, buddy. <laughs> If you don't mind me taking some liberty with the scriptures, you're, you're out of here, buddy. You're done. So he says, what are we going to do with this Haman? And one of the assistants speaks up and says, well, you know, Haman built this gallow to hang Mordecai. Why don't we just hang him there? So Haman is hung and impaled on the same device that he built to kill Mordecai. And you'd think the story ends there. But here's what they discovered. When they went back to the king and said, King, we need you to fix the problem. He says, well, I'm sorry. Anything that's in a decree cannot be overturned even by me. So even though Haman was dead, the decree that had been signed into law to kill all of God's people had to be fixed. So the king looks at the signet ring and he goes, who are we going to give this to? And he looks at Mordecai and he says, I was reading last night when I couldn't sleep and I discovered that you saved my life all those years and nothing was ever done for you. Let me give you my ring of authority and you fix the problem. He places the ring on Mordecai's hand and then Mordecai signs into law and has it curried throughout the land. That not only are God's people to be protected, but they're to be saved, prospered, and blessed, and all of the king's assets go to God's people. Now, what if I were to tell you that's not even the best part of the whole story? You see, God is mighty in battle over the plans and promises for your life. And whether you realize this or not, the story of Esther and of Mordecai is actually the redemption of something that happened hundreds of years earlier. Let me back up. In 1 Samuel 15, God anoints Saul to be the first king of Israel. You remember this? And he gives Saul one assignment. I mean, this feels like me. Kevin, I'm going to give you one assignment, and I didn't even get that one right. He gives Saul one assignment. He goes, you're going to go down, 
and you're going to destroy, he gives it through the prophet Samuel, you're going to go down and destroy the Amalekites and not let anybody live. Kill everything. You remember this story? How many remember this story? If not, go home and read this afternoon. It's fascinating reading. Saul gets down there and starts kind of walking through things, and he and King Agag of the Amalekites strike up a relationship, and Saul says, well, if I keep you alive, I can keep your stuff too because your stuff stays with you. So Saul makes a side deal with King Agag to keep him alive. But God said, don't let anything survive. Put it everything because I, 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 I want this problem against my people to be taken care of forever. And in that disobedience, Saul loses his authority and his kingship. Everybody look up here. Here's what breaks my heart. David was far more vile, disobedient, rebellious, and downright mean than Saul ever thought about being. And I've always wrestled, God, why so redemptive towards David? And so unmerciful towards Saul, it would appear. Not that I'm trying to tell you, God, how to run the universe or anything. Though, don't we like to try, all of us? God, I think you could move a little faster, answer a little quicker, and could you put a little more money in my paycheck? Come on, somebody. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And I, I was talking to the Lord about this. Lord, what about poor old Saul? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said, Kevin, do you not believe that I'm mighty in battle over my plans for your life? I'm like, well, Lord, I do. He goes, don't you know that you can't do anything to destroy the plans I have for you? Have you not read Jeremiah 29? I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you hope and a future and to prosper you. And I said, well, Lord, yes, but I need to... I need to see some redemption. He said, well, did you not read the story of Esther? I said, I did, Lord, but I don't get the connection. Here's the wild part. Did you know that Mordecai the Jew was a Benjamite and he was a direct relative of King Saul? Here's what's even more funny. Did you know that Haman, the Agite, was a direct descendant of King Agag of the Amalekites. Wait, wait. That, that didn't get all the way back here. <laughs> this, this young man right here sucked all the revelation right off the... Off the, off the did, 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 are you making the connection here? Hundreds of years earlier, it appears that Saul forfeited his plan through his disobedience. But even though Saul messed up, God held on to the plan for his family. He said, you might have messed it up, but I won't let go of it, Saul. And years later, the blessing of authority comes back to Saul's descendants, Mordecai. And the king that Saul let live is the descendant that gets hung on the very gallow that was built for God's people. Come on, somebody. Isn't that amazing? My point is God is mighty in battle over the plans for your life. He's mighty in battle against the enemy that's warring against your soul. He's mighty in battle for the miracle that you desperately need. When I see God hold on to these plans and purposes for our lives, it gives me such encouragement to know even if I don't see it in my lifetime, I've got to become a kingdom-minded person that realizes if God's made a promise, and even if I mess it up, God will hold it for my kids and my grandkids and my great-grandkids and my great-grandkids, even to a thousand generations. Aren't you glad that you can't mess up enough that God's plans and purposes for your life run away from you? Come on, somebody. Is somebody not glad you can't send it away? I know you're like, you're like, well, preacher, I don't know about that sending it away thing. Well, put up real quickly Esther 10, 1 through 3, and let me close with these. Did you realize that the book of Esther is not even about Esther? Let me prove it. King Xerxes, Esther 10, 1 through 3, imposed a tribute throughout his empire even to the distant coastlands. His great achievements and the full account of the greatness of Mordecai 
whom the king had promoted are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of the Medes and the Persians. And Mordecai the Jew became the prime minister with authority next only to the king himself. He was very great among the Jews who held him in high esteem because he continued to work for the good of his people and to speak up for the welfare of all their descendants. Do you realize what this is saying? At the end of the book of Esther, it says this whole story was about Mordecai. Really, can I just say this? It was really about Saul. And the fact that God said, you might have messed up, but I didn't let go of the plans and the promises that I made. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And and Bruce, do you remember that old song, I need thee, Lord, I need thee? Lord, I need thee. Can we sing this one time, let Bruce sing it? Would you just close your eyes just a second? And then I got... Every hour I need thee. Come on. Every hour I need thee. My one. There's one part in that course that says, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need thee. It won't matter what key you play in. I just sing in my own, Bruce. So. <laughs> I know that Pastor John's got to come in just a second, but I got one prophetic thing that I got to do, and then let me minister at the end if you, if you want to just ha- let me pray for you. Um, I don't know if you follow Hebraic calendars, but whether you do or not, about two weeks ago, we stepped over into a brand new Bible calendar year. I know, I know Gregorian, what hangs on your wall, says it's September of 2023. But in God's timing, and that never changed, we changed, he didn't. According to the scriptures, it's 5784, and it just happened, shifted into a new year. My daughter Kelsey and I went out to a conference in Dallas that was just celebrating this. And I always go uh, or send somebody because I feel like God, God actually gives me revelation for the year ahead on how to pray. You see, I used to think that the whole thing of following God was this mystical plan. I started realizing God's really practical. He's really practical about giving you a way to move forward. And so the Lord told me when I got on the plane, he said, I need you to pay attention with everything you see. Because what you see is actually a word for you to go forward. I'm like, this is great, Lord. I'm going to have have an angel. I'm just, every time I'm believing, I'm having an angel visitation. I'm going to see an angel. I haven't seen one yet. My wife's seen like four. I'm like, she doesn't even preach. She doesn't need to see an angel. Well, Lord, how about it? Help me here. My wife says, it's only the pure in heart that see angels. I'm like... She didn't say that. She just, we're just, we kid with each other. So I'm like, Lord, I'm going to see something. And the only thing I get when I get to the airport is frustration everywhere I'm turning. We walk up to the rental car place that we've paid for a rental car, prepaid. I walk up. I'd never heard of this company. I'm standing in line. It's a beautiful display, but dear God, it was inefficient. There were three people in line ahead of me, and there were five agents, and 45 minutes later, I've not moved. I'm like, do y'all have any cars? And I'm standing there, and and so here's my temperament and personality. I'm either really laid back and chill, or I am totally impatient to the point of of embarrassing whoever is with me and myself. And I have nothing in between. And generally, I go from zero to 100 with no warning. So I'm either like, hey, everything's cool, or I'm like, dadgummit, you're about to get draw my ire so now i'm standing there and i'm so frustrated i'm like do y'all not have a car and all of a sudden i hear the holy spirit say this is what you need to see that's ordaining your year stop complaining and lift up your eyes and watch what i'm about to do and as i lift up my eyes i'm looking at this video screen right in front of me with all the agents you know with the people that are getting their cars and while i'm looking it goes from their logo 
Literally, the Holy Spirit says that. It goes from the logo to a brand new BMW 2024 X3. I'm standing there looking, and I'm like, isn't that a beautiful car? I'd love to drive that. Now, understand that I have bought the smallest $39.95 compact car because I'm cheap. And my figuring is we're just driving from the airport to his conference. We're going nowhere else. We just need something that's got gas on a steering wheel. There doesn't need to be any comfort. Just we'll suffer. And I'm like, Lord, it'd be really cool. I said, but I don't want to pay anymore. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, well, then look for the right agent because there's favor to be had. And I'm like, well, Lord, maybe you've delayed this whole deal just because I'm getting favor, right? So I start... And all of a sudden, this young man walks out. And as soon as he walked out, I was like, that's our guy, Kelsey. Start, start praying. Sure enough, everybody got assigned to different places. He gets his station open up, and he goes, sir, I'll take you. And it's me. We walk over. I stand in front of him. I smile real big. He goes, hey, how would you like to have, at no cost to you, a 2024 BMW X3 to drive while you're here? I'm like, if you insist. (laughs) You remember the Lord says, if you'll watch, it'll be favor. He says, the only thing I would need from you is, if you don't mind, let me send you a survey. And if you find my service favorable. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said this. He said, in this new year, I want to offer to you an upgrade you don't deserve at no cost to you. But you've got to wait patiently. You've got to see with eyes of faith. And you've got to stop cursing things with your mouth. You've got to start speaking in faith and decreeing over everything you see. So I wrote it down. I'm like, Lord, this is really cool. We go to the conference. We sit there for eight sessions. The way they run the services there is they have these baskets at the front. So when the guy's preaching, if he's preaching good, they bring the offering and put it in. So some get more offering. Than, and it's, it's for the place. It's not for the speaker. But it's just that's the way they give. And so I've sat there for eight sessions. But, I mean, this guy's nailing it. So I'm like, I'm going to get up and go put something in the basket. So I get up and, and walk up there. And when I walk, turn around to walk back, the conference host who, you know, I, I know just casually because he's come and spoken at our church a couple of times, I wouldn't say he's my, we don't have, he didn't give me his number because he knows I'd call him all the time. So he's, <laughs> he's, he's hiding from me. But he stops me. He grabs my arm as I'm walking. He's sitting right where Lisa's sitting. And, and he, he, as I'm walking back, he reaches out and he grabs me and he says, hey, let me, let me give you this postcard. And he hands me this postcard. I got it in my hand. And I just, I took it and I says, thank you so much. And I put it in my back pocket And we were leaving, so we grabbed our stuff and ran to the airport. I'd never even looked at it, didn't think about it. You understand that the Lord had spoken that word to me standing in the rental car center. I'm going to give you an upgrade this year. It won't cost you anything, but you got to wait patiently. I'm going to open doors for you you can't open for yourself. I'm like, praise God, that's awesome. So I'm getting ready for coming here today, and I'm asking my wife to help me pick out my outfit so that I don't embarrass my kids or myself. So she said, I think your blue jeans would look great with that blue blazer you got. Just wear a white shirt and some brown shoes or brown belt. And I said, can I wear my new Air Jordans? I said, said, yeah, they won't won't care. They won't look at your shoes. I got some Air Jordans on. Say, it's got to be the shoes. Some of you understand that. So while I put my jeans on this morning, I reach back two weeks ago. I was at this conference. I'm like, what is this in my pocket? And I pull out, and it's the postcard that the speaker of the conference gave to me. And the title of the postcard says, Expect Unexpected Doors to Open. The Lord spoke it to me at the beginning. I wrote it down, and I had been holding this postcard in my pocket for two weeks. And I only found it this morning when I got up to come preach to you. So I thought, well, i got to go over to my church for the 9 o'clock service this morning, get them started. So I, so I prayed for some people. That I said, if you need an unexpected door, I'm preaching somewhere else. It's their word, but you can get in on it too. So wouldn't you know, after I prayed for everybody, I looked on the stage 
and somebody had left a $50 bill. And what's interesting is because the Lord told me, he said, you know, your gift always makes room for you. It's not my gift to sing, but it's when you release a gift, it opens a prophetic door every single time. And the Lord said, before you go this morning, I'll put some cash in your hand for something you need to do. So I came this morning with a double confirmed word. That here's what God wants to do for you today. You see, there might be plans that you've given up on, things that you've abandoned, healing you thought that you've quit praying for, a restoration of a marriage, the fixing of something with one of your kids, uh, the repairing of an unforgiveness with a business associate, something from your past a gift that you feel like you were supposed to do that's, that's, that's laid dormant all these years and has never been revived. Listen, you might have given up on the plans, but you see, God's waiting, holding on, ready to manifest those things, even if it's in your bloodline years later. So here's what the Lord told me as I was driving over today. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do with this postcard? What do you want me to do with this? He said, well, there'll be somebody there that works on doors. So I'll just start there. I don't know if your company works on doors or you fix doors or whatever it is. Would you stand to your feet real quick? You do something with doors in your business. Is it you, sir? What do you do? Come here. How old are you? 42. What's your name? Who's having a 50th birthday this year? Somebody here's got a 50th birthday. Who's, huh? Nobody here? Come here. So John, and what's your name, sir? When's your, when's your um, 50th birthday, Garrett? December. December the 4th. Turn around here, let me pray for both of you guys. Look at me, turn around with your backs. Garrett and John, do y'all know each other? Are you friends? Like Are y'all related? It was a rough night with the dice on, 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 on Friday. Friday. Yeah. Are y'all like friends or something? Karen's fault. He had the big dice and she won. I'm not. I'm not sure. I want to know what this is. Sidebar. <laughs> Sidebar. Turn around. Hold your hands out. Lord, I just thank you for John, and I thank you for Garrett. I believe prophetically you're opening something for them. So the Lord told me there'd be somebody here that was turning 50, one person, and I, he'd given me this $50 bill to put it in your hand as yours, as a seed, to say that everything that you've lost previously, that this is a year that it's coming back to you. I don't know what the losses are, but there have been things that have deeply wounded you and have been a loss in your past. And, and because you like to laugh and cut up, the, you, you'll move past it, but the Lord has not forgotten that it was a loss. And he redeems that that is lost. And so he told me simply to release over you and say, right now, I call right now into return every single thing that has been lost. And I pray right now for you in the name of Jesus that as you step into this year of Jubilee and begin to thank the Lord and wait patiently and declare and speak in faith, that the Lord says there'll be an unexpected door open and an upgrade for you. And so, Garrett, I just release that over you right now in the name of Jesus. And I say right now, as you take that $50, it ought to be a seed for you to know that God saw you. He released that this morning, put it in my hand to bring it to you, to say to you, Unlock the prophetic destiny on your life. I just pray right now it would be unlocked that you would realize that what God's called you to is way bigger than you can even possibly see. So I tell you to step into your purpose and into the plans that God has for your life. Now I pray for you, John, that there'll be unexpected doors this year that God swings wide. Actually, as you repair and install doors this year, if you'll begin to prophesy over each one that it's an open door. Did you know that there are four open doors in the book of Revelation? There's an a, a open door of worship. There's an open door of declaration. There's an open door of faith. And then there's an open door into the heavenlies where you get to see activity in heaven. And if you'll do the first three, God will open the fourth to you. And I say right now that that's your activity this year. 
that God's going to open the door to the supernatural things and let you see them this year. So don't be afraid of them, but know that God is opening you and giving you eyes to see. And if Garrett's really your friend, he'll share that $50 with you in Jesus' name. (laughs) Amen. Amen. So I bless you guys, and I pray that this would be a beginning seed. What it is is it's a seed. It's a seed of prophetic ministry for the church this morning to know that this is the year where God is returning what's been lost. Will anybody claim that for themselves? Only my brother in the back. Does anybody here want to claim it? Say, say right now, say, I decree everything's returning that's supposed to be in my camp. The other word is this, that God's opening joyfully unexpected doors of favor. Say, I decree that my unexpected doors of favor are swinging wide in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me let these guys finish, and then if um, I can pray for them, I'll do that or whatever you want me to do.